Hi, this is Paul. I Some people sent me this video, and I've watched it a couple of times, or pieces of it a couple of times, and I knew immediately I wanted to do some talking about this video. Um, Grim Grizz has been <laughs> doing some commentary on my commentary, which has been fun. And it was this or a little commentary on, on Of Mice and Men, which is a video that poor... Grim Grizz said I hadn't watched enough in order to make some of my manism uh, videos that I've been doing lately. But this this video I watched and and a bunch of it really stuck in my head. And so I'm just going to play through it. I'm going to do a straight commentary on it. And there's a lot of stuff here. I didn't know anything about this channel, but there's probably some more stuff in this channel I should dig into. Um, I, I mentioned on Twitter that social media is, is sort of Viagra to people who have woke and uh, anti-woke um, uh, <laughs> I don't know how graphic I want to be uh, it's it just keeps it just keeps the it just keeps the um, it just keeps it going and I get a little tired of both I get a little tired of the drama around it Um Maybe because I'm not inundated with it because I work in a church where I don't have to be. But let's let's jump into this because I thought he made some excellent observations about wokeism and transhuman future. And I've got some differences with him, but he, he managed to articulate some of what I've been trying to articulate with my progressive liberationism since I probably wrote that in 2013 when I was dealing with it in my own denomination. I wanted to talk a bit about the moderate left and what gets called wokeism because I think everyone recognizes there's something radically different about the modern version of the left and what's motivating and what's animating them than as with a lot of little, lot of videos including mine things take a little time to get going but by about 6 8 minutes we'll be we'll be cooking with gas has been traditionally the case for the left and wokeism itself is a strange kind of phenomenon that needs explanation. And I think a lot of the explanations that are offered to explain this miss the mark to varying degrees. You could call... Now, now, part of, with almost everything we talk about in these social contexts, they're, multi, they're multivariable. So um, we can identify many different marks, but they're sort of a Vervakian... Uh, relevance realization to find a critical aspect and I think in almost all of these cases especially when it comes to human participation in these movements there are multiple multiple layers going on for any given individual about what they're doing and why they're doing it all this Marxism but this is very different from any traditional sort of Marxism you could call it just more liberalism I think it is accurate to call it liberalism but at the same time clearly there's a radical difference between modern liberals and liberals even of the 20th century. It's not really an explanation to look at the theories of John Locke or Thomas Hobbes and just say it was a direct line of descent from then, that as soon as a theory of property rights and individualism was formulated, that it was going to end up with uh, the kind of borderline religious sacraments we saw last year with the BLM movement. And some in the more radical right would look to Christianity and say that this is a Christian movement, that wokeism is actually the true essence of Christianity. But this also, I think, misses the mark, even though there may be some truth in it. Certainly we see this more in post-Christian societies than anywhere else. But to say that wokeism is the true essence of Christianity, uh, that it's more true to Christianity than actual Christians, uh, I think is very much mistaken. And when you look at the way that these people view the world, sure, there are similarities to Christianity, there is overlap, but there's also radical differences. Uh, there's positions that would be radically heretical to the Christian worldview. Now, of course, I've spoken a lot on this, a lot of Tom Holland. It, it isn't so much, I mean, even his conceptualization here is sort of static and flat, which sometimes you need to do that. But, you know, there's certainly, I mean, my thesis has been, this is this is definitely a 
something downstream of Christianity. It is a it is the pursuit of it, it is a Christian heresy, I would say. One way to analyze the phenomenon of wokeism is to look at the way that language has evolved in the last couple of decades under its influence. Recently, there was the trailer announced for the new Matrix movie. And it's interesting to look back at how much language has shifted since the original Matrix movie. Now, Duchowski sisters who directed the Matrix are both trans women. And they've since come out and said that the Matrix was something of an allegory for their struggle as trans people. Uh, Originally, there was a character called Switch who was meant to be male in the Matrix and female outside of the Matrix or vice versa. And this was shelved by one of the producers. But you can see in the Matrix, there is this kind of Gnostic picture of the world that suggests that perhaps... Now, David Bentley Hart has been writing a lot in his substack about Gnosticism. I haven't had a chance to read it all, but it's in terms of the use of that word, there's a lot of discussion as to what what that word means, how it played out. And But I think where we're going in this video is a lot of these questions about this a two-world mapping, okay? And I've, I've mentioned this in a variety of my other videos. There's sort of heaven, spirit, mind, and there's earth, um, there's earth, flesh, matter. And so many, so much of what we're doing is all about the particularity of the dance of these two mappings. And this is why, you know, I told John Verveke, we're not going to get rid of a two worlds mythology. These, the mappings on this world are just, they just keep coming around. And so much of this is because, not just, I shouldn't say it that way. So much of, you can understand this from below by the fact that we live this way and we can't help it. Our our thought is in some ways abstracted away from the age of decay, while our bodies and our materiality is subject to the age of decay. And again, this is a this is another very old observation that the Greeks really sort of, you know, churned a lot on about about decay and forms i mean this this just keeps going so so we're going to have to talk about gnostic here and what he means by gnostic and i think he does a good a good job of describing it as as the video goes on someone's real identity is in a certain sense outside of the confines the prison of the material world and I think he's right. And so a lot of I mean, people sent me this video and said, this guy's talking about a lot of the stuff you've been talking about. And he's right. And they are right. Because I keep talking about the secret sacred self. Because where this self is located is a very big deal. You will, you will find in the New Testament when, when you read, our life is hidden with Christ in the heavens, that's similar to this. Only... Currently, with this new, with new this new worldview that is being expressed, and a lot of what we're doing is sort of watching the expression and trying to distill the essence of it to understand the mechanics of it. The secret sacred self is where people are locating there, and you you find this all over the place. Their true self. You can see this in so that the conversation around George Yancey's book. Um, where progressives are sort of leaving Christianity behind. And there's an aspect to this where you will hear people in progressivist circles always talking about their true self. And I have colleagues and friends who have reformulated the gospel into this true self way. Now, I don't think that's necessarily that is not nece- that is not necessarily a heretical way, but you have to have a fairly sophisticated understanding of the location and the source of the self to to not have this wander away into what this um, what is called in this video Gnosticism. But at the time of the first Matrix, when people talked about transgenderism. 
that was seen as basically equivalent to being transvestite. It was a man or a woman um, acting out as the opposite gender. And in the years since the first Matrix, language has changed such that we recognized that a trans person was a man born in a woman's body or vice versa. And I think the point he makes there is really a good one. And I hadn't noticed that. And I watched this video and he said that I thought, yep, he's right. That's a that's a that's a really profound thing to notice. And and this is where the evolution of language is deeply part of the evolution of the imaginary in which we inhabit both as individuals and that we create amongst each other as a society. That is why language is so important. And so that transition right there is is really a profound one. Uh, tra- the first matrix, language has changed such that we recognize that a trans person was a man born in a woman's body or vice versa. And this is a radical shift that is part of wokeism that is actually transforming our whole understanding of reality. It's easy to laugh this stuff off as SJWism or whatever, but these things have come to define people's understanding of the world. Their true language and true normalization of certain concepts, they're shaping people's whole metaphysical understanding of things. And wokeism is a kind of metaphysics. It is a kind of pseudo-religion, I believe. But that transition wasn't the end point. Because we've even moved on from that conception of things where now sex itself is socially constructed. And gender is not binary in that one is uh, born a man or a woman in a man or a woman's body. But there is no binary of sex and there is no binary of gender. There's infinitely many genders or gender is a kind of fluid spectrum. At that point, when gender is no longer binary, it has no connection to sex at all. It has no connection to any reference point in the material world. So gender now... And, and that's critical, this, this idea of a reference point in the material world. I speak often about the end of modernity because modernity is, in a sense, the, the discipline determination of all reference points being in the material world. Now that, I think, again, has always been an overreach because we, we are, again, mapped on two levels. We are mapped to heaven, spirit, mind, and we are mapped to earth, flesh, matter. And anything that is one without the other is no longer human. And this goes all the way back to the beginning of the Hebrew scriptures. The living nephesh is the stuff of earth and the breath of God. And you see this again and again and again in the Bible. You see this in uh, uh, Machu Pajot's book. Once you lose this duality, you lose humanity one way or the other. Then humanity is simply a you know, a trousered ape, but apes do not do what we do. <laughs> and, and then you lose. So if you, if you, if you go all the way down in terms of, of modern materialism, you begin to lose things. And then you, you know, people try then to construct the second level from the first, which they've been trying to do for a long time. We need to account for consciousness. We need to account for our imaginations of eternity. We need to account for our imagining the forms. If you lose this, if you lose, this is what human beings are. And this is how we are different from anything else that we know, any other creature we know on earth. So so what this video gets very right is, this nexus point is is right where this this issue is so telling. But what we're going to see is that it doesn't actually just you know just doesn't float float off into space. It it wraps these two in a different way. Is a sub reference has no connection to sex at all. It has no connection to any reference point in the material world. So gender now is a subjective identity 
which no longer has any connection to anything in the physical world and is something that has no objective referent. It's just something that we understand someone to be based on how they describe themselves and the categories that they use to describe themselves don't have any definition because, again, they're not connected to anything in the physical world. So there's no... There's no point in talking about masculine or feminine because masculine and feminine are the expressions of male and female and the dynamics of male and female in the material world. And so masculine and feminine go there. It's a complete elimination of the category, but it isn't, which is part of the deceit of this because... They, we're going to completely get rid of the category. Oh, but then playing with the categories in terms of expressing the secret sacred self also then can't be done and are meaningless. And so in a sense, you have to walk away from it completely and be non-gendered, but you're simply not going to do that in the material world with the history that it has. Um, and people have come to accept this, but this is a radical revision of our whole understanding of reality. Now someone's identity is an entirely subjective, entirely interior thing. And people might think that this is quite... Okay, so now we have another dualism that we're dealing with, interiority versus exteriority, or private versus public. Now, there's a degree to which there's a mapping on mind, which can be private, and matter or spirit and flesh. And so again, we're not going to escape this we're not going to escape this two worlds mythology mapping. We're just going to continue to weave it together in a different way. Quite similar to say a Christian understanding of the soul, you know, someone's soul inhabits their body and of course their soul isn't physical, uh, so it is a kind of ghost in the machine, but this isn't the traditional religious or Christian understanding of what the soul was. Traditionally, this kind of more radical dualism where the soul or the psyche was totally separate from the material world and inhabited physical bodies as a ghost in the machine uh, was associated with heretical sects of Christianity like Gnosticism and uh, non-Christian movements like Manichaeism. But in Christianity, they took the Aristotelian view of things, this hylomorphic perspective where we are composite beings, so far from being an external instrument, the body is part of our personal reality. And while it now that I mean, obviously, there's a huge history, and it's so difficult to talk about. And so I'm not in any way going to criticize his having to deal with this at all because it's impossible to deal with in in such a short in such a short time, but all of those questions about soul and spirit or soul and body, I mean, they're all again bound into this, this, this two world mythology and how, I mean, part of what happens, you know, again, Barfield is so helpful here because spirit and wind are one. It's Ruach, it's Panuma, and then you have loss of participation and then you pursue final participation. So we've been we've been working on these questions of heaven heaven spirit mind and earth flesh matter for a very long time and when it comes into our essence where we're a living nefesh we are the the binding of the the breath of God and the stuff of earth, and again you have ancient you have ancient anthropologies that are at play about you know the breath being our life and you know all of this stuff and then as sci as increasing scientific knowledge comes in these things get complicated and so so much of this has been a, a continual attempt to try to keep this thing together and i think he's dead on right that the new developments are significant in that ongoing conversation it can't exist apart from the soul it's not inferior 
the idea of the soul in Orthodox Christianity would be the substantial form rather than the ghost in the machine. You can separate the... And, and of course, when you say form, you have to have a pretty vigorous understanding of a philosophical tradition and conversation to have a fair understanding of how you're using that word in that sense. Body from the soul in analysis, but not in fact. There's this idea of the body-soul composite. And this is really the traditional understanding of things that was ruptured uh, in the modern age, especially with Cartesianism. And you get this view of the world where there are two uh, irreducible substances. There is the outside material world, uh, there's matter, and then there is the interior uh, subjective world of the, the psyche, and neither one is reducible to the other. Now, now, it's helpful to remember that this Descartes inherits this language of substances from, again, from older, you always have to do this if you're going to use a language, but we're getting into this Cartesian dualism where the, there must be a spirit substance, and then once you have these two divorced substances, you're going to have a lot of questions about can there be integration when, by definition, they, in a sense, occupy completely different spheres. Now, this is really the whole basis for the modern understanding of the world and the modern project is a wholly inductive model of research combined with a totally mechanistic view of nature. And in this picture, what looked like elements of nature misattributed to the human intellect are removed, like the idea of final causes, formal causes, purpose at all in nature. Now, when people like Francis Bacon were promoting the scientific method and promoting this use of inductive reasoning, this was never intended to serve as a metaphysic. But for the purposes of the scientific method, the interior, the subjective, was placed in a separate domain. But it was kind of inevitable that this uh, pragmatic step would turn into a kind of metaphysics. And, and that's my lab leak hypothesis, that to, to remove these aspects of purpose and meaning at this particular level in order to measure the speed at which a ball drops from a tower in Italy or a whole variety of things, this was, this was, this was vitally important in the lab, but then the virus gets out and affects everything, and now suddenly there, there is no teleology to anything that's of so if you look again you look at Wilfred Sellers that's of the great divide that's of this whole manifest image and there can be none of it in the scientific image but the scientific image then you know a la scientism as it's sometimes called sort of totally overwhelms and says this is all there is this is the only knowledge we have and therefore we have this sort of provincial primitive imagination, where there's meaning, where there's narrative. You can find this in like stories of old, where now we know that there's no meaning in narrative. And so, and of course, this is a lot of what we've talked about with, with John Verveke. This is, this is where this sort of happens. And then quite obviously, you have a meaning crisis because there's no space in the world for meaning. And, and so then what meaning gets reduced to is this provincial, romantic, private, uh, emotional, imaginary even thing that soothes our, our little primitive animal natures because only the truly brave and bold can be, um, can be, sure enough to stand up in public and say none of this nothing means anything that we can't hear that you know it's it's you know you can't handle the truth and this kind of radical dualism this radical separation of the interior and the exterior the objective and the subjective has become a popular metaphysic and this lends itself quite well to the idea that 
the interior self needs to be liberated from the constraints of the physical world. I'm not, because I, I think that's actually a reaction against that metaphysic. I think that is what is in many ways at the heart of romanticism, that part of what happened in modernity, because it is so it is so hostile, once that lab leak occurs, it is so hostile to the way human beings have always lived and desire to live and want to live, that there have been this whole various waves of reaction against it. Surely an earlier one, uh, you know, early one is romanticism and you have Rousseau and, you know, in time the, the attacks get sort of, um, the attacks get integrated then into the system. And so as successive attacks come, you know, they eventually get integrated into the system. So, you know, for example, Pentecostalism in Christianity is is just a complete denial of modernity. And you have this constant war between the manifest image and the scientific image. The scientific image always wanting to sort of get out and say, this is all there is. And the manifest image saying, you can't hear, you can't speak that with a human voice and have any integrity for the rest of your life. Um, Scottish common sense philosophies, you know, similar thing. You, you think all these things, but you can't live it. C.S. Lewis comes after H.G. Wells and, and other atheists of his day with this charge that you, you simply can't live this way. Um, Brett Weinstein goes after Sam Harris with this charge in their conversation from a while back. This is an ongoing war between the science, the scientific lab leak that that creates scientism and the way human beings not only have to live but want to live. And that led from the constraints of the physical world. And now, I I think when it when we ask about constraints from the physical world, I think this is a far older desire on our part from living within the age of decay where, as C.S. Lewis said, every instance of love ends either with death or betrayal. And so what we find throughout human history is a desire to escape from the age of decay. Now, of course, Many people are going to say, well, we can dismiss, a la Freud, we can dismiss any of these escape strategies as wish fulfillment, that we wish to escape the crushing realities of death and decay in this world. And so that's what we then tell ourselves stories and have rituals and create religions and all of this because we can't own up to the fact that we just like the rats that we exterminate we are no greater than those rats finally and the only thing that separates human beings from anything else we find in this world is that we have aspirations of eternity but sorry to say no luck. And then, you know, even the atheists then cheat by saying things like, well, we can have experiences of wonder. Oh, okay. Because that's what they're saying is that's all you've ever had is an experience of wonder. And so on one hand, they sort of prop up the brave new atheist who who proudly and boldly and stoically looks into the looks into the gap and says or goes to the funeral looks into the grave and says done you might have a memory you might have some warm feelings but that's it you can all go about your business now and the really hardcore atheists should say but never have the guts to um you know, why don't we stop all this memorializing as sort of cheap romanticism? And but but of course, there's way too much in the cultural code 
to let that sort of thing really fly, both on the side of how dare you disrespect my sainted parent as I grieve their loss and hasn't so much of our best flights of imagination fallen victim to the ontological argument because if you if you look at every work of fiction and say it's just made up stories just made up stories who wants to be that guy so the atheists you know the atheists don't do this either they love the meaning and the narrative and the drama and the heroism and the idealizations as much as your most ardent religious escapist. That liberation, the purpose of that liberation is to give that interior self a free, open space of possibility. And, and so this internal liberation outside of the age of decay is, is what we long for. Now, what's interesting about wokeism is that it both creates the vision of liberation and insists that heaven can be found on earth and not through some divine intervention, Jesus coming at the end of the age in a white horse with the hosts of heaven, but rather with social engineering. And, and learning to curb our tongues. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say, for the Wokies all around are ready to cancel you. So choice really becomes sacrosanct. When there's a picture of a soul uh, that's intimately tied up with... Now, now choice being sacrosanct is vital here, But, and that's often a critique from conservatives against the woke, but notice that it's only certain choices that are sacrosanct. There very much is a new law here. You can annoy 95% of cisgender people for the sake of 5%. Now, now, There, it's, it's just a new law, and this is where it's religious and tyrannical and idealized aspirations are sort of exposed. A conceptuality. So choice really becomes sacrosanct. When there's a picture of a soul uh, that's intimately tied up with a conception of God, with a conception of objective values, with a conception of the good, uh, the soul only makes sense uh, in reference to a laid stone of an absolute good. Uh, of course, within the Christian conception. But again, I believe what's driving this is the far beyond the wokesters, the, the sort of retreat position that many are taking of, because the self has no space in our world, we're just going to create a new space for it. And it's going, it's because there's no space, it's secret, it's private, it's not public. It is sacred because it's the frame through which you have to interpret the world. That's the secret, sacred self. There is a perfectibility of the soul. When you have a totally mechanistic view of nature. Now, it's, there's a dualism in there. On one hand, the soul is perfectible. The secret, sacred self is perfectible, but there's another sense in which the secret sacred self is itself already pure and there's a separation between the you that you experience and the secret sacred self. In other words, there's an idealized you that you are aspiring to become. You want to become your best self now. Now listen for that language in almost all the therapeutic, the, the entire therapeutic industry. Even the anti, you know, you need to become your best self, my best self now. So the secret sacred self is, in fact, your idealized self, and you need to strive to become that, to express that, to have the materiality express the spiritual, okay? So the secret sacred self is spiritual, and you are a pilgrim longing to finally attain that level 
of, and you can place all kinds of other words on it, enlightenment, as it were. And you shift from the soul to the self. Uh, the distinction is that there's no objective good for a self. A self is... See, and again, I would differ with that because I think if you listen to the woke, if you read, you know, when this thing was starting, when I first began to notice it, I, I also began to notice the tyrannical aspect of it. So one of the websites that I kept bumping into was Everyday Feminism. I thought, all right, I'm going to read Everyday Feminism every day. And so many days I would make an effort to try to read an article on Everyday Feminism. And I found its legalisms to be even more confining and restraining than almost any um, popular religious regime found in America today. So I'd say this isn't pure volun this isn't pure ego or will. This there is there is much more law beneath the surface here. It does have structure. More a kernel of subjectivity that's kind of encased in these multiple layers of physical constraint. And we're no longer really embedded or embodied in the world. Now we are thrown into the world. We're thrown into bodies. There's and I think this is right. We're th and, and now he's going to draw some draw some ties to existentialism, which I think are really important in this. We are thrown into the world. This is this is existentialism. Now we're getting into into Heidegger. There's a thrownness to life, and so somehow in our physical manifestation, we are divorced from the secret sacred self. And it is, it is our mandate, it is our, it is our duty, and the job of society is to facilitate the, the theosis of the individual into the secret, sacred self, and to achieve that. There's now a thrownness to our nature that's wholly arbitrary. And when you're thrown into the world like this, Aspects of your identity that come from being an embodied creature, uh, your sex, your race, your nation state, uh, your particular traditions, your language, these are no longer valuable aspects of your identity. These are now false and arbitrary impositions that are actually hindrances to the true realization and exploration of your true self. I, I think he's dead on right there. And so then one might add, well, ask, well, what are the, if the secret sacred self is the substance, what are the accidents upon that substance? And they are variable, but, but then you're going to have to ask, well, what are sort of the navigational what are sort of, sort of the navigational lights and indicators for the for the material human being in the quest for the secret sacred self and that of course it will be feelings and feelings of authenticity that are going to pull me towards this 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 soul substance that um, and, and lead me to discover along the journey and the process, I mean, notice all this language that we've been using, to, to achieve this secret sacred self. But now there's going to be a lot of aspects of secularism that are come to play here because, as I mentioned, I just did a, a podcast with a, um, a young Greek man. I mentioned... Part of what secularism is says, all you have is this postcard, this five by seven card within the secular age to express, now, now this will change from people, to, to express the secret sacred self and to finally get it out of the ideal and into the actual. Now, some might say best life in the future, yada, yada. People will play with those things in terms of an imagination, but in terms of the public sphere, if we're going to achieve this, we need the entirety of our society because we're we're socially constructed. So in other words, we have to 
We have to refit all of society for my individual needs. I mean, it's an enormously selfish, it's an enormously selfish religion. Which is something and exploration of your true self, which is something that is wholly psychical, wholly subjective, and denied the chance for self-exploration and discovery by these arbitrary collective impositions. And so you can see how the liberal ideal of individual maximalism or the leftist tendency toward liberation projects takes on a special metaphysical, almost spiritual significance now. And while the woke left is quite a modern phenomenon, you can see its antecedents in the movement of modernism and leftists and liberals that attached themselves to that in the early 20th century in the United States. And modernism and people like Oscar Wilde and James Joyce and Friedrich Nietzsche were very focused on this idea of self-discovery. And this really comes to fruition with the existentialist movement of the mid 20th century and its maxim that existence precedes essence. The means of salvation in a meaningless, absurd universe that we're thrown into against our consent is this project of the absolute affirmation of the self. Now, the reason that things like the LGBT movement are so important and the reason that wokeism has really brought this front and center is because this really pushes this dualistic picture of the world into center focus. And, and I think that's right. And not enough attention has been paid to why sexual liberation is so central to this agenda. And, and some might say, well, that's because sexual repression and control was so central to Christianity. Okay, but you haven't, but would it, would it be perhaps not arbitrary that in fact it's central in both for a reason? Partly because Oh, there's a lot of reasons for this. But but I think this this moment here of noting its centrality as perhaps one of the more pure expressions of this. You know, um, Rachel Donazal, of course, was not allowed to transcend the lack of pig pigmentation in her skin into a different identity. Now, not race and and you know even Richard Dawkins asked the question because others are picking up on this on, on what's happening beneath the surface here in terms of this implicit religious movement that is dominant in the West. Um, wait a minute, all accidents, why the sexual aspect so predominant? And when you think of the worst possible sins that you can commit today in terms of how it's viewed by the radical left, the worst thing that someone can be today is a racist, um, with you know a close second being if someone is sexist or homophobic. And another terrible thing that you can do is to generalize. It's just an accepted maxim now that you can't generalize. To generalize someone is evil, even if there's good empirical reasons to think that a generalization may be accurate. It's and it's, it's, such a, it's such a cruel dogma for this religion because anyone who sits down and has any understanding of what is required to live in a human city knows that there are sim there's simply too much information in a city you need generalization in order to live. Every time you step onto a sidewalk or cross a bridge or get into a car or shake somebody's hand, you can only do these things because of generalization, because there's way too much information out there, and so you have to cut it by making assumptions, and these assumptions are all built up by filters within us of past experience and watching each other. So... To, to have 
to have generalization be a sin is one of the most cruel dogmas you can imagine. It's just absolutely evil to impose that on someone. Uh, and what these have in common is... This is something going around YouTube. And so this this poor person, I mean... Oh, I've got to... Wait a minute. I've got to get this up on the screen. Can't see it. You know, supposedly this, this whole movement is all about the poor and the oppressed. And so here you have some poor guy. Okay, I just had to make a generalization. Here you have some poor guy who's working his minimum wage fast food job, and he's just trying to take an order and do it in a hospitable, polite way, having to, because the English language is sort of constructed the way it is, having to presume something about the person who's just rolled into the drive through and... Why does it matter? Oh, it doesn't matter to you. I'm so, I mean, but to me, I'm a male. Okay? Okay. So, what are you? So I can call you a sir or a ma'am. What are you? What would you assume looking at me? What are you? What would you... So, and and this, this poor guy is just trying to do it right. Tell me, tell me your pronoun and I'll use it, okay? Please, I'm just trying to take the order here. I, 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 I don't want a conflict. I don't want a fight. Would you assume looking at me? I assume that you're a man. Okay? Okay? He's, he's just trying to get through his day. Please. So, so generalization is, is a huge part of this. That the worst possible sin in this pseudo-religion is to constrain the absolute freedom of someone's self with reference to something in the material world. Now, now the, the therapeutic is a big part of this too, because of course... It's, it's the full realization and expression of not just will, but desire. If you claim that uh, someone is uh, limited by something biological about themselves, whether that's uh, race or gender or something else, then you are affirming physical constraints over the subjective psyche, which is meant to be absolutely free. And, and I think his, his points here about physical constraints, I think are, are dead on right and key to understanding this whole thing. And the right and the left both justify themselves now with an appeal to the liberation of the self. In the case of the left, they believe that the self will be liberated by a destruction of prejudices, destruction of things like racism, homophobia, but also a destruction of those embedded identities themselves by an end to identification with national groups, with religious traditions, with gender. And the left believes that the best way to achieve this is through collective action, uh, through the state. The right the establishment right disagrees but it's really only a pragmatic disagreement. The right believes that this transhuman future will be achieved through the function of the market. And they certainly have history on their side when they point to the market as the force that has liberated people from traditional gender roles, that has um, destroyed traditions and ended prejudice, brought women into the workforce and so on. Uh, and now, now, there is a lot of generalization here because obviously... Some on the right are looking at this, but definitely not all, and definitely not all the religious people that I talk to regularly. This is the disagreement of establishment politics today. And both justify their side of the project with reference to an absolute evil. And the absolute evil since the Second World War has been the Nazis. And Nazism occupies this kind of metaphysical evil because it is the affirmation of the physical over the psychic to the point of a people being wiped out just for a physical characteristic. I see, and I think his, I mean, if he, listen, if he listens to Tom Holland, 
a little bit of reading, let's say, Timothy Snyder with respect to Black Earth, his point is actually stronger because it was the Jews that, you know, Tom Holland just recently said in the Plowcast that I played, uh, that I released on Thursday morning. I don't know when I'm going to release this one yet. You know, it was the Jews that get blamed for what Christianity did, and which is just a tremendously cruel irony. But the the idea was that the Jews allowed humanity to get all into this top layer mapping. And if you take that away, then here from below in sort of a radical naturalism, the strong will take the weak. And all, of course, all the second order mapping a la Nietzsche was, you know, slave morality. So, so I think his, his, his point is almost right here. He's, he's right and his, he's right here and it's stronger than the justification for the point he makes. It's the absolute denial of that interior space of that group which was persecuted. And so the left and the right both justify their positions as basically the best position to prevent another genocide. The left says that that genocide was caused by racism, by tribalism, by racial collectivism. And so the focus should be on destroying that kind of racial collectivism through collective action. The right disagrees and says that that genocide was caused by statism, by the worship of the state, and the way to prevent something like that arising again, the way to prevent uh, collective racialism is through weakening the state and promoting individualism, individual maximalism, and individual rights. Now, again, I'm not sure about his, obviously in a video you have to generalize um, and make sweeping comments in order to at least make a comment about something. It is true that at the end of the Second World War, there was a tremendous anxiety about nationalisms. And so I, I take his point here. He's almost making the point that the right has the same goal as the woke in terms of the culmination of the secret sacred self. Um, I I think there are actually many there are many competing ideas. There are probably more competing ideas in conservatism because by virtue of the nature of conservatism, there are just many more kinds of, cons the people are trying to preserve many more types of older worldviews. And so there is to a degree a certain amount of this that has been assumed into our culture, but I don't think it is quite to the extent of as this, even though that's been part of the way that the sweep has gone. You know, one of the videos that I made a long time ago is why the left keeps winning. And I think some of this is behind that. And this is the dynamic, this is the dialectic of liberal pluralist societies uh, that is accelerating and becoming more explicit now with wokeism. And what's interesting is that many of the early proponents of what we know recognize as sort of woke left ideas were also proponents of transhumanism. The best example is Martine Rothblatt. Martine Rothblatt is a trans woman who has donated hundreds of millions to advocacy for the transgender movement and she wrote a book called From Transgender to Transhuman, a manifesto on the freedom of form, which in my opinion is maybe the ultimate manifesto for what's called wokeism. Because in From Transgender to Transhuman, Martine Rothblatt says explicitly that transgenderism is really to be understood as a first step. It's the uh, bringing in of this revolution of the freedom of form, as she says. And she spells out clearly that this new picture of the world is about liberating the self from the physical world and technology will be the means by which that is achieved. 
where and you could see this in a variety of things that have been upload on Amazon Prime to a certain degree the good life so I, I think he's right here this this definitely is how so so if you if you rewind all the way back to and I I, I don't have any way to evaluate this Jordan Peterson continues to say that Jung's observation was that the turn to to alchemy and physical science was because, in a sense, the um, the spiritual path of the church was not achieving, let's say, and I'm I'm riffing here, achieving everything that we dreamed it would, and so the idea was to look for another path and to find in technology ways to secure for us even the short-term dead reckoning solutions to the kinds of problems that commonly assail humanity. Now, especially now, given the increasing power of our digital, virtual media, it's no wonder that we are flirting with imaginations of transcending our body and living in a virtual space, because right now so much... So much via movies and stories and music, so many joys we are experiencing are coming via those avenues. And one can only imagine once, you know, if Elon Monk, Elon Monk, Elon Musk perfects his neural link, how much how how powerful a drug this will be i mean pornography is a powerful drug movies are a powerful drug music is a powerful drug these regularly afford within us indulgences and experiences of bliss and escape and timelessness and self-transcendence if our technology gets better, how much more? And then, you know, the the limitations of only being able to experience sex as a man, well, wouldn't it be better to experience not only sex as a man, but as a woman? Because wouldn't that be more than just the one? Well, how could that be possible? Wouldn't it be wonderful for me as a man to have the, the experience of childbirth? Shouldn't that be something that I should strive for? And and so now we, we sort of get a sense of this secret, sacred self as substance upon which the entire panoply of blissful human experience and meaningful human experience can be written upon. That is, in a sense, the eschaton, the goal, the sumum bonum, the, the thing to which we must try to achieve. Now, again, we're, we're bumping into secularism, which is why in our imaginations we go to often dystopian dreams, such as, again, Amazon Prime's upload. Eventually, just as uh, you know, prejudices towards sex disappeared as women entered the workplace, that technology will make it so that none of these physical differences matter anymore. We'll all be augmented it would be possible to separate our consciousness from the body and so talking about someone's identity as related to the body the physical world at all is just going to become outdated by technology and transgenderism is really just a, a first step on the road to that recognition in the conclusion to that book she writes quote together law and science heat and light are tools we must use to liberate society's potential for unlimited expression of sexual identity. As we do so, we evolve from wise man, homo sapiens, to creative person, persona creatus. We emerge from our prison of sex into a frontier of gender. We step from a history of biological limits up to a future of cultural choice. We unleash at long last the full, unbridled power of human diversity on our planet's prolific problems. The outcome of this gender awakening will be a new species, a new transhumanity, one that has as its fundamental purpose the assurance of a healthy and fulfilling life 
for all who value that right. Now, now there is a degree of chronological snobbery in that idea because it simply assumes that, well, because we have greater life expectancy, because we have better health because of modern medicine, because we have broader vistas of experience a la movies, music, digital arts, all of these things, surely our life must be better than our ancestors. Can we really say that? Well, then there's some other assumptions. Well, more better experiences afforded by longevity surely must be better than short better experiences that are cut short by shorter life expectancy. And it's not an unreasonable thing to make, but part of what dogs us is that there is no measuring stick, despite the fact that if you go into the hospital, is your pain a one to a 10? That's not a scientific measure. It's as good as they got, and it's probably good enough for a lot, but we're, that's that's sort of stuck with the mind matter duality that you can't measure pleasure and pain like you measure water in a test tube. It doesn't work that way. Suffering and 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 so much joy is enhanced by suffering, and and suffering can be mitigated by joy. These things are not like measuring water and oil and trying to figure out how they interact with one another. So that's a that's a big issue in this, actually. Now, I think if anything captures what wokeism is, it's this passage. She's affirming here the project, uh, the utopian project of the liberation of humanity from form, from nature. And you can see the kind of religious nature of this, where we started out with this constraint of the natural world, and we are progressing gradually to this eschatological horizon of the final liberation of the self of humanity from the constraints of nature. And in this kind of pseudo-religion, as you can see, technology takes on a religious significance. Technology, techno-capital, is the means by which we are liberated from the physical world. Now, there's a wonderful coincidence of wants here between what Martin Rothblatt is promoting and other aspects of the post-war order and the desires of the oligarchs. Not only does this line up perfectly with the post-World War II mythos that justifies the exclusion of nationalism from the public square on the basis of the inevitability of genocide if people collectivize racially in the West. It marries itself perfectly to that because if the absolute good in this pseudo-religion is the liberation of humanity from the constraints of nature, then again, the absolute evil is judging people on the basis of physical characteristics is racism and racists. And so the Satan-like figure uh, in this view of the world is Hitler. Uh, and so that lines up perfectly as the negative aspect of the positive vision of the world being promoted by this transhuman view of things. And, and again, if you go back to the plow conversation with Tom Holland, um... Susan Black? Esther, I actually, so when I made my little Twitter summary of my video posting today, I noticed, because I was I was looking up the who were the editors of The Plow were to see if they were on Twitter, and I discovered that I was actually already following one, and then Esther had known, yeah, I was, you know, she helped make the connection to Tom Holland, so it's like, okay. But, I mean, Tom Holland nicely lays out a bunch of this stuff about Nazism, and again, as videos that I did six or eight months ago when I did a little bit more spade work into the philosophical and religious backgrounds of Nazism, um, you know, the, the argument here is actually more stark than 
um, I forget the name of who is making this video, Keith Woods, is even more stark than what Keith Woods is saying here. But there's also a perfect coincidence of wants between what the woke transhumanist movement wants and what the oligarchs and international capital wants. Both want the destruction of inborn identity. I, I thought this point was really powerful. Both want this fluid picture of humanity where someone's identity is decided entirely by choice. For the capitalist, that's consumer choice. That's right. And their identity is decided by choice and their identity. And this is where this is where the irony of the religion of the secret sacred self gets deeply conflicted with a hundred years of psychology and sociology because part of the denialism beneath the religion of the secret sacred self is the idea that that the buffered self to use now charles taylor the buffered self is sort of making their progress towards the theosis of finally perfectly expressing the secret sacred self or even maybe it's not even a destination maybe it's just a a path and a process you hear those strains often in the culture that that somehow this this pilgrim self is buffered from the the allures of the harpies of commercial society that all of the come hither moments by apple and any of the brands that we we fill our empty identities with um the this, the secret sacred self is, again, to, to riff on some of the quest for the historical Jesus, the dark reflection of ourselves that we can't recognize because the water at the bottom of the well is at such a distance. And so I see, I see someone down there looking up at me. Yeah, it's your reflection. But the sides of the well are filled with billboards from the most powerful influence machine humanity has ever created. And so if you find yourself in Apple, don't be too surprised. And if Steve Jobs is a prophet, don't imagine your secret sacred self is somehow free from the sirens of consumerism and the capitalist desires a destruction of anything that is a barrier to profit and traditional social orders traditional moral systems traditional gender roles nationalism these are all barriers to international capitalism they're all barriers to commodification they're all barriers to the capitalist ideal of a borderless globalist world in which prejudice is absent and again people are purely defined by consumer choice and there's no barrier to those people consuming in fact there's a necessity to them consuming because consumption comes to define their identity right and that's where this gets very circular my secret sacred self is jedi what a surprise you've been buying the happy meals and imbibing the and imbibing this the stories all along now this is of course sort of where the jordan peterson stuff gets interesting because a la joseph campbell well there are actually archetypal structures down beneath that the commercial interests are playing off of disney was not arbitrary in selecting the public domain material that he would appropriate and do his best to secure in the private domain and keep through lobbyist money foregoing <laughs> entrance of the mouse into public domain. So 
there's a lot going on here. But the, the naive individual who is very much outgunned by principalities and powers within the consumer system gets to be the dupe that is, I'm expressing my best Jedi now. Okay. And so the woke left's project of emancipation also becomes the international capitalist's project of commodification. And this is why wokeism has been and will continue to be so successful, because it gives a religious like legitimacy to the projects of the oligarchs to create an international global market and the project of the Atlanticist powers since the Second World War. Shoot, that guy looks a lot like Job. Are you hearing me, Job? This dude looks a lot like you. I know it isn't you, but it sure looks a lot like you. And he seems kind of European-ish. So, just saying. Or to prevent an outbreak of nationalism. And finally, as mentioned, it gives a religious significance to techno-capital itself as... And, and I think it would be it would strengthen the argument or at least it would be worthwhile to pause and say, okay, what do we mean by a religious experience? Because do you mean an emotional experience that has long sort of been located in religious registers? The means that has liberated humanity and will eventually liberate humanity from the physical world itself. Now, it's interesting that this kind of belief system would pop up at what seems to be the end of an empire, the end of a period in history. And Gnosticism, uh, that dualist Christian heresy, popped up at the end of antiquity. And some people have compared the woke left to Gnosticism. You can certainly see the similarities in the picture I've laid out. But what's different is, you know, Gnosticism was a kind of Western Buddhism. And it still had a spiritual picture of the world. It still had a picture of ultimate reality. And it was ultimately pessimistic. Okay, and so now, again, we're back to this mappings of two worlds mythologies that I don't think you are going to get away from and maintain what, at least within the this tiny window of civilization, we have known to be human. and And in some ways... Nazism was almost an end to humanity because you wanted to get rid of the top register in some ways. But it was also deeply romantic. And, and so the top register would come via romanticism. About the potential for liberation within nature. Ultimately, the point of Nazism... And, and, that's, and that's the question because... In antiquity, it was, so when Jesus shows up, the claim that Jesus is God, well, I don't know if he's doing miracles, if he's rising from the dead, if he's turning water to wine, if he's stilling a storm, that God, yeah, that's the right word. Human? No. Now, of course, that gets inverted in modernity. Well, we're really skeptical about the the churning water to wine, the stilling a storm, or raising the dead, uh, and and the resurrection. We're deeply skeptical about those things. But human, sure, you could see the inversion. Gnosticism was to turn away from the world to achieve gnosis or enlightenment, union with the true God uh, beyond the evil demiurge, and and, and you could see. Some of that, and let's say uh, Amazon Prime's upload, and and there's within that also a critique of the consumerism because it's a it's sort of a freemium plan when you uh, when you upload your consciousness into uh, servers. But again, this is this is all being constructed from the bottom because that's the that's the dominant public. It's the dominant public metaphysic that we're dealing with today. 
and reject the physical world. It was a pessimistic creed, but it was also a spiritual creed, whereas this transhumanist picture of things, this selfism, maybe is a good way to describe it, this uh, absolute commitment to the liberation of the self, this is fundamentally an optimistic view of the world. Again, it sees things as progressing inevitably from constraint and prejudice and imposition of uh, inborn identities to liberation of the self. Now, I think that's right, but it's a very naive one. And I think if, if someone wants to read the beginning of C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce, you can see why. Because one of the things that you quickly realize as a pastor is that you know a lot of people have complaints about their spouses. Marriage is hard. Well, why is that? Well, because suddenly you're living with another will. And, well, you know, for the sake of a vision of a romantic future and, and sex and ideals and a dream fulfilled, you can sort of push that will away for a while. But as year after year and decade after decade begin to go forward, at some point the will's like, hey, I want to have expression of my will into the world. I'm a, I want my will to be a functioning spirit that gets instantiated in matter. And what you begin to realize is that there are other wills in the world that are opposing you. And so at the beginning of the great divorce, you begin with this gray city. And in this city, you can have, in other words, you can manifest, we'll use that fun, trendy buzzwords or holy words, you can manifest anything you want simply by thinking of it. And you might think, gosh, that's got to be heaven. I can have anything I want just by thinking about it. No, it's actually hell because the one thing you can't have in hell is communion with other people because you have differences of will. And the free choice of the self liberated true technology. And it also lacks a spiritual aspect. It doesn't have a picture of ultimate reality except the mechanistic scientific view of the world, which is bound up with technological progress, which ultimately will serve as the liberation of humanity. But this always remains a wholly imminent project. There isn't an absolute good. There isn't a gnosis or an enlightenment. There isn't a God to commune with. And there isn't eternal life, except potentially an infinitely extended life a true augmentation and technology. Now, what's interesting here is that this is perhaps the telos of Charles Taylor's buffered self, in that the self is ultimately alone because no other will is allowed to impinge. Now, again, this is a very naive self because the naive self believes that the secret sacred self, which is the source of this, also has a secret sacred will, which is pure. And so ideas from like Rene Girard that we actually borrow desire from one another are, are going to be found to be hazardous to this. But again, there's, there's all this, there's all this cross pressure in it because part of the social constructionism is, we can code everyone else's wills and desires by social manipulation. Okay, well then, what will is doing the coding? What is the good that is going to be coded? And then suddenly you have a massive frame problem where you have all of these secret sacred selves that are themselves the frame, and it might be their lived experience of oppression or you know, some denialism of the will that has to be undone. And so you have then all of these different frames. And of course, these different frames aren't going to be able to realize because very quickly, two of the ones that we see in competition almost immediately in our culture is the crisis of the patriarchy versus the crisis of racism. So when which identity will finally be the deciding identity when you have a clash of identities. If a 
black man harms a white woman, who's the victim? Is the black man doing the harm, the victim of racism? Or is the white woman receiving the harm, a victim of patriarchy? Well, let's take the harm out of it. When a black man marries a white woman, what's the What's the pathology beneath the surface that has ironically caused this? Is it the is it the objectification of the white woman or is it the racist escape of the black body now internalized and expressed for the desire for the white woman? I, I mean these these things will not end and there can be no peaceful landing for any of it. And it doesn't take long to recognize that hierarchies are brutal in that some are always more equal than others. Even in Gnosticism, there was a certain inborn difference in the quality of people. There were hylics uh, or somatics who were the lowest of people who it was said would never be able to achieve gnosis and there were psychics and pneumatics who were higher types who were more open to enlightenment or to the gnosis to an understanding of things uh, even that is is absent from this transhumanist selfish view of things so there's none of the spiritual value of traditional religious structures in this it's a and and again i think if in its idealized form as constructed by this video, there aren't. But out there in the world, and, and I think, I mean, the point I just made is that in some ways there can't be. But when you look at wokeness on the ground, again, just read every day, just read a whole bunch of articles from everyday feminism. There's a structure there. Now, is it incoherent? Yes. Is it going to not stand the test of hierarchy? Yes. But people are experiencing those things perhaps in its idealized version there can't be because it's it's finally incoherent the wholly imminent utopian project that finds its fulfillment in the material world and in this project of liberation and that's why adherence to this pseudo religion are so animated so motivated so aggressive in a way that say traditionalists are not because the traditionalist doesn't believe that their ultimate purpose, their ultimate realization or liberation will come in this life. The adherent to wokeism is entirely fixed on this utopian endpoint, this eschatological horizon of liberation of humanity from the material world. And that's why I think wokeism is here to stay. And this is exactly probably my biggest disagreement with this video. This is why I think wokeism is doomed to die, and in many ways sooner rather than later. Because there are so many inconsistencies with it, and human beings are so multifaceted. The, the woman worried about patriarchy has a son. You know, some of the, in terms of their, in the, when the Jordan Peterson meetup is is going, you know, when we'd started the Jordan Peterson meetup, we always had women come in. Many of those women were older women. And many of those older women had sons. They loved their sons. And so it's a rare older woman that can write, and I read that article before, that can write that even her sons are not safe. Now, not all sons are safe, of course, but I, I don't think this finally lasts. And unfortunately, these things tend to die when enough people have blood on their hands that they shed in the name of righteousness. And then they begin to realize that they're not bringing a, they haven't brought down heaven. They've brought up hell. It's not just a fad. It's not just millennials with too much time on their hands. It's not just something that was 
conjured by a few think tanks to distract people from economic issues. No, I, I agree. It's not just those things. I think a lot of this is right. And then the questions then go to So back to my back to my argument, my interpretation of Alistair McGrath's book Heresy. Heresies finally are exposed when they are played out and found wanting. When the dream is pursued and found not worthy even of human aspirational dead reckoning. So I'm not saying that there won't be damage, but I am saying it's finally unstable. Now, the elements that have gone into this, especially the transhumanist, the, the new power that we have via technology to afford ourselves the kinds of experiences that formerly simply with mechanistic manipulation we were able to achieve. We're already experiencing this in terms of drugs because I, I often make the argument that if you're actually a consistent If you're a consistent utilitarian, then mass distribution of cocaine and suicide available firearms is the way to maximize a biochemical experience of happiness and make sure there are no sufferings afterwards. You have your first great cocaine high and you end your life afterwards. That's a purely rational way to ensure maximum happiness for human beings. And if you're going to try to say all happiness is plus and all sadness is minus, you can eliminate the minus, maximize the happiness. There you have it. Why don't, why when I say that people are, you know, people, of course not. Of course not. I agree. Of course not. And a lot of that has to do with meaning because meaning is how humanity has for a very long time realized that we don't simply live happiness and suffering. That's, that's not an adequate metric to actually measure humanity. And happiness is not actually simply wish fulfillment. And so suffering, and, and this is where, if you watch John Verveke's Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, his, I think his improvement of Buddhism, when he recognizes that, you know, some of the, some of the articulations and explanations of Buddhism that I had heard was just all sort of in a flat landscape of happiness and suffering. No. Verveke is right when he says, no, it's it's agency. It's, and uses some of, we can use some of Charles Taylor's language, fullness, reciprocal broadening versus reciprocal narrowing. Reciprocal narrowing is what happens with an addict. Reciprocal broadening, if, if there's the narrowing that we can see, might there not be a broadening? There's sort of an ontological argument direction for better than we know. And this is in many ways in alignment with C.S. Lewis's argument from desire that you can find in mere Christianity. So uh, call me an op optimist if you read Jonathan Haidt's Happiness Hypothesis. He calls talks about the the cortical lottery. I've been a big winner of the cortical lottery. I'm very low in negative emotion and I'm very high in openness and I tend to be by nature optimistic. This Someone might dismiss my Christianity by virtue of my personality profile because I believe Christianity is in fact that way. And I'm not saying wokeness won't cause a lot of damage, but I don't think it's going to pan out. And 
has it peaked already? Well, the further we see it go, the more resistance we see it gaining. And for now, a lot of that resistance is sort of quiet and mousy, but push people too far and more stuff comes out. So I, I think, though, the analysis of this video in terms of, you know, I sort of adapted it a little bit to some of my language, the pursuit of the secret sacred self and the the vision, the energizing vision of this religion as being escape from physical limitations and utopia found in the mastery of those physical limitations, I think is right. Now, I, I think a an aspect of our current culture, though, is that that's already well underway, is a suspicion of modernity and our powers. Built into the ecology crisis is a suspicion that we're really not smart enough to manage the planet, and that tends to lead us back towards sort of a naturalism, which is in some ways similar to Nazism. I mean, the Nazis, again, if you read Timothy Snyder's Black Earth, the Soviets had a high degree of optimism of, of intentionality, Ian McGilchrist's left brain, that through rationality and intentionality, even though their dialectical materialism ran on its own, Stalin believed he could prime the pump by starving Ukraine and Belarus. Didn't work. Nazism certainly had a high degree of rationality, but they were rational in their destruction of certain kinds of rationality, and namely the, the above line, and they sort of swallowed a reading of Nietzsche that suggested that well, if we get rid of the Jews, then we'll then things will radically go back to normal and we'll stop with this this cursed slave morality and the superior will finally win in the material world. They they couldn't recognize some of the simplistic romanticism that was behind their vision and in fact once you have a vision for the good, you're already working in the upper registers of heaven, spirit, mind, as opposed to earth, flesh, matter. And again, this two worlds mythology we are not going to escape from. We will not. And we see all of those ambiguities continue to roll around in our present dispensation. So, yeah, it's a good video, and I learned a lot from it, and I thought it was helpful, but there's some of my critique. And if um, Keith, I know now via YouTube that he'll get some notification that I've used his video fairly extensively, Keith, if you want to talk about it, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you about it, and um, that would be great. So thanks for the good video, and those of you who watched this, leave a comment.